Hi. I really wish I could be with, there with you in Bradford. Uh, I have a lot of family history there. My mother grew up back of the mill on Silk Street, uh, and her mother and father before her, and her grandmother and grandfather before that. I have great memories uh, when I was uh, 14 years old, staying in my uncle's caravan up on Bailden Moor, sighting off of the uh, chimney of Lister's Mill and just heading across town, uh, sometimes hopping over fences to get to my grandmother's house uh, for lunch. It was uh, a really wonderful uh, uh, place in my memory, and I'm sure it's still wonderful. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today is a notion that I've used at O'Reilly, um, as kind of a motto, which is create more value than you capture. Now, I came to that notion originally when I um, was told by more than one internet billionaire that they really started with an O'Reilly book. And I thought, how wonderful is that? You know, that we sold somebody a book for, say, $30, and they went on to build a billion-dollar company. And uh, one of my uh, team, a guy named Brian Irwin, kind of actually formalized that line. He said, create more value than you capture. Let's make that a company motto. And we did. And uh, I've watched that throughout the development of the Internet. You know, look at the enormous value that was created by Tim Berners-Lee when he put the web into the public domain. Uh, look at the enormous value that was created by Linus Torvalds when he made Linux available for free, or uh, when Larry Wall made Perl available for free, or Guido Van Rossum made Python available for free, and on down the ranks of all the wonderful open source projects that uh, basically built the world that we live in. Uh, that's creating value, uh, but it's not capturing value. Uh, and then on the other extreme, uh, particularly with the recent financial crisis, we've seen uh, companies that are very adept at capturing more value than they create. Uh, they rip people off. Uh, they trade against their customers. Uh, they make enormous wealth uh, that's measurable, but they destroy value for society. And I think this metaphor is one that should guide uh, all of our actions. Uh, in particular, I, I want to focus on uh, one aspect of this, and that's the way that our failure to measure value creation rather than value capture uh, forces us to miss a lot of what's going on on the Internet. I was having a recent conversation with a guy named uh, Hari Ravishandran from Bluehost. And uh, they're a large hosting uh, firm. And he mentioned that they have 10 or 15 or 20 million small and medium sized businesses as customers. And uh, that there was a recent McKinsey study that pointed out that. Um, when a small business has a website, they see, I forget whether it was a 23 or a 32% increase in sales. And, and he was saying, that's because of open source. And he wanted to give something back to the open source uh, uh, companies because of this in some way, or the open source projects. He, he's, he said, look, be, we're able to offer this low-cost hosting to these businesses because uh, we have all this free software available to us. And so that notion that um, you know, value can be created by one party and captured by someone else is really the virtuous side of our economy. And I'd really love to see us understand um, that value creation economy uh, much uh, more deeply. And this notion, when I was talking with Hari, uh, I, I remembered a paper that I read many, many years ago. I think it was published in 1975. It was an article in Stuart Brand's Coevolution Quarterly, which was his successor to the Whole Earth Catalog. It's called The Clothesline Paradox. And it was talking about uh, accounting for alternative energy. And it made the point that when somebody puts their clothes in the dryer, uh, you know, an electric dryer or gas dryer, uh, we, we measure that. We, you know, millions of dryers add up to some measurable amount of energy, and we 
kind of see that as energy usage. When somebody hangs their clothes on the line, it doesn't get moved from the fossil fuel column to the solar column. It just disappears from our accounting. And it struck me when talking with Hari how much uh, we were seeing exactly the same thing with open source software. And this clothesline paradox, uh, that is a value that's created and not accounted for, uh, can skew our policy debates. So, for example, uh, recently in the United States, we had this massive uh, debate uh, about something called the Stop Online Piracy Act. And what was so fascinating to me about it was how much the debate was subject to uh, the clothesline paradox. Uh, on the one hand, you had Hollywood arguing that piracy is costing them jobs, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, whenever somebody watches something for free, they lose money. Uh, but it struck me, for example, that while Hollywood is claiming losses all the way down to uh, the farmer who didn't sell his corn because the popcorn wasn't consumed in the movie theater, uh, on the Internet side, we had no similar story. And yet, consider this example. Somebody pays $60 or whatever the equivalent is over there in the U.K., uh, to a cable company uh, to watch television. It's recognized as an economic transaction uh, for content. Uh, but when someone pays the same amount of money to their ISP to watch, quote, free content on the Internet, uh, it disappears from our accounting that somebody is paying for content. Now, it may well be that on the Internet we are watching content that was created for nothing, YouTube videos, or a video like this one. And uh, that does not appear to be an economic transaction, uh, but it is. It's an economic transaction out of a, another kind of economy. And going back to both the clothesline paradox and Hari's insight that the value of open source software is being realized by those small and medium-sized businesses able to use uh, the web uh, and advertise their services cheaply, uh, create ser uh, uh, services for consumers, the value is captured completely differently in the economy than where it's created. And I think we'll find this to be true of other aspects of the Internet creative economy as well. We're in the early stages of a fascinating new set of developments uh, around how creative content will be funded. Uh, we see bands who are being able to uh, fund themselves with YouTube advertising. We see uh, uh, the Kickstarter economy really starting to take off. Uh, we see this TEDx movement where people are uh, teaching each other. Uh, and this sharing economy is creating value. And ultimately, when value is created, there are ways to capture it. And I think we'll start to see this sharing economy start to intersect with the financial economy in new creative ways. But I want to urge all of you uh, to think deeply about this notion that what matters is not how much value you capture for yourself but how much value you create. Uh, because in the end, what we create uh, is what makes the world go round. Thank you.